So thank you so much for joining us here today. No, thank you for having me. Thank you everyone for coming. I didn't know if anyone would turn up. I thought that'd be embarrassing, wouldn't it? So I wanted to start with your own time at university, uh -huh. beginning with your time at Oxford. Right. Could you tell us a bit about how your years here impacted upon your career and the rest of your life? Um, yeah, I think um, obviously impacted hugely, right? I mean, this is a sort of fantastic institution and it was a privilege to have studied here. Um, one of the things that kind of most directly impacted the rest of my life as I'm an actor is the kind of work I did here doing student drama just because I met a lot of people, uh, people who I'm still friends with, close with, people who are in the industry now, some people who aren't, but obviously that's always the nature of it. Um, but in terms of it being a place where I could sort of try and hone my craft makes it sound a bit too fancy really, but um, just try things out, try and fail. And I always say to people who ask, what should I do if I want to be an actor? I say, do it, do acting, do plays, do make short movies, do whatever it is, but um, make sure you're exercising those muscles. So this was a fantastic place to do that. And that was a really big thing for me. I'd sort of come out of school and come to university and I wasn't able to do as many plays as I wanted to at first because at the time I was shooting the Harry Potter films and um, uh, that sort of put me in a weird kind of conundrum where I didn't want to go and audition for a student play and then say actually I'm not available because I have to shoot a movie. I thought that would make me look like a bit of a dick if I'm allowed to say that in here. Um, so it was only really when the Harry Potter films finished that I started doing plays here, but um, I learnt a lot from that process, as I think you invariably do for doing the thing that you love. If you invest in it and you put the work in, um, you make mistakes, you have the opportunity to learn from them. So it was big for me in that way. Thank you. And you went to Westminster before coming yeah, to Oxford. I did. Can you talk to us a bit about the role that you think privilege and opportunity like this has in the rest of your life if you want to go into the entertainment industry and have a career in acting? Yeah, I think, I think as probably in most industries, but um, certainly my industry, uh, sort of entertainment, acting, is uh, the kind of demographic of people who went to, you know, a fancy public school like I did and then went to Oxford or Cambridge, is hugely overrepresented. Um, and I think that's a massive problem. Um, it's a problem because it affects the kind of stories that get told. Um, it's a problem because it affects um, the way those stories get told. Um, and that ultimately, I think, ends up creating a barrier that is not helpful for the work that's being made, whatever it is, it, it, even if we're talking sort of wider about the sort of wider cultural map. The flip side of that is, on a personal level, yeah, I mean, it, it was obviously it was advantageous. It would be foolish of me to sit here and be like, no, everything I've achieved, I've achieved. Done, but I sort of have no time for that narrative. Um, certainly not in my own case. <laughs> um, so, so, so that was huge. You know, I've been in rehearsal rooms where there have been, uh, in my view, kind of too many people from a similar academic background, and I don't think it feeds the room in the way that it might if uh, it were more representative. Um, but you know, in, 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 in my case, it's a bit more complex because you know, I'm a young black man, so the way that intersects with it um, is a little more problematic. My dad's white, blue-eyed. Um, he came to Oxford, went to a public school before that, and he was an actor. And, uh, he did a lot of period dramas. I've never done one, you know. That seems like a sort of glib point. But um, we make a lot of period dramas in this country. Do you know what I mean? There are opportunities that I haven't had in my career because of how I look, but then other opportunities that I absolutely have had on account of my education and all that privilege and everything that that's given me. So um, I'm grateful for it, but I guess I look at it um, a bit circumspectly. Leading on from that, there's mm. been quite a lot of scandal and criticism of the entertainment industry mm. for lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. Just from your own personal experience, how have you seen the intersection between race and diversity and the opportunities that are offered to you within the entertainment industry? Um, so I alluded, it to it, I alluded to it before, but I think there's something I personally, and this 
please no one in any way take this as a sort of poor me narrative because it absolutely isn't at all. And I'll go into it, but there's so many ways in which the opportunities that I've had have led directly to my career uh, in, a which that that, in a way that that doesn't always translate so directly. Um, but um, I think if speaking posh and having gone to Oxford and Westminster, uh, I look like my dad, there are jobs that I would have done. Um, being a black man, there are jobs that you're not likely to be considered for, or there's a slight, <laughs> um, uh, it, it, it feels like an unexpected choice. Um, so I sort of, I think, perhaps fell between two stools in a way. Um, and now I look back at it, I think it's probably unsurprising in the way the industry has been changing recently and the fact that I'm not the only person who's done that, that my career kind of really changed with a job in America, you know, where I think those things kind of function very differently. Um, and certainly at that time there was more discourse around race and, and representation always certainly felt that way to me. Um, that is a conversation we're certainly having here now. Um, and I think the industry is the better for it. Um, but uh, as I say, I think it's, it's telling that, that I ended up going to America and finding work there. I mean, look, part of that is because it's a massive industry and a lot of stuff gets made. So a lot of people get opportunities there who maybe didn't hear. Um, and, you know, who am I to say that if I hadn't got that job, I wouldn't have got another job here? the week after, you know, you can never know with these things. But um, I think my career has kind of occurred at a time of sort of change in that respect. And, and, and I think I've certainly been the beneficiary of it. And you've been in the entertainment industry for quite a while because of your role in Harry Potter, starting mm. from such a young age. Mm. In what ways have you seen it both positively and negatively change and evolve since you started out? So I'm loath to make any sort of grand pronouncement of how the industry has changed since the year 2000 because I was an 11 year old, you know. Um, but yes, I think that for me is the main thing that has directly affected my career that I've been aware of. There, there's conversation around diversity, um, which is not just about we need to get more X kind of actors on the stage, but we need to tell stories from that perspective, and we don't. And that's why we say there are no parts for these people, because those people have historically not been given a position where they have what we call in Portuguese um, lugar de fala, a place of speech. Do you know what I mean? They haven't been sort of empowered in that way to be, um, to, to be the storytellers. That's something that's changing, and that's going to transform things in quite a significant way. So for me, that's sort of the really big thing um, yeah and as an actor with the platform that you have what do you do you feel any sort of responsibility or role to engage with this platform to promote activism or political to, to engage with political issues of the time yeah I have a, I have a bit of a complicated relationship with this really um, uh, so I think individually I believe that everyone has a responsibility to engage on some kind of political effort, uh, level with the kind of questions of our society. Um, what makes me more uncomfortable is doing that from a platform when my platform is not something I've attained through expertise in that area. Um, I had this conversation with an activist once in LA who said, well, then what you've got to do is, is, is sort of use your platform to direct people who do have that expertise. Um, I, I think there's a lot of validity to that argument. It's something that I'm constantly weighing up, but I feel like to some degree, even doing that is buying into a system where actors on television shows get listened to <laughs> and experts don't necessarily. Um, and I think that's really problematic. I, I, to sort of give an anecdote that slightly illustrates my unease around it, I went to a gala in LA once um, for this charity called the Rape Foundation, um, who do fantastic work with survivors of sexual assault. Um, and I was sort of doing this with a gala event, so it's actors and people wearing swanky clothes and there's nice food and people give money and it's, it's great. But um, I was asked on the red carpet, you know, why do you think sexual assault sort of still happens? And I was like, oh, I, I mean, 
how long have you got? Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's sort of historically endemic. I mean, we live in a society that's an ankle in so many ways, but certainly along gender lines. I mean, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sort of muddling through my answer. And then I just sort of felt really sort of slightly bummed out about the fact that I was really getting asked it, that I had this platform to talk about this. I thought, uh, uh, this, is a, this is an institution that we're supporting here that has experts, people who work in this field. And am I going to give a sound bite that someone's going to listen to? It just felt backward to me. So, you know, I, uh, I went and campaigned for the election more recently for one of the major parties. Um, and... Uh, I did that as an individual, but um, I was on the tube back um, after a day of traipsing around at the rain. Um, and some people recognized me on the train. And they said, can we have a picture? And I sort of thought, oh, is it ethical to leverage this? And I thought, I, d I, d I don't think it is. I didn't feel like, oh, I said, yes, as long as you voted today. And I didn't say, as long as you voted for this party. I just said, as long as you voted today, sort of jokingly, but trying to start that conversation. I thought that's, that was as far as I was comfortable with going. I mean, it's a dialogue I'm still having with myself and, and I have to try and better understand where I can justify my intervention, whatever that would look like, because I don't have social media, so probably my intervention, any kind of intervention is pretty minimal and maybe I'm flattering myself to even think that it's, you know, that reach means impact. You know, I think those two things don't necessarily translate. Is that unease that you have part of the reason that you don't have social media, or is that completely unrelated? Um, I think that is part of it, certainly at this kind of stage of my life. I mean, the real reason is, or the initial reason was much more banal. Um, I used to waste a lot of time on Facebook. I used to just waste loads and loads and loads of time. I was still at school. Um, and I would sit there, I went to a boarding school, so, or I was a boarder, like during prep. And I would just sit there, just like looking at people's holidays for, for photos. And I'm like, why am, I, why am I wasting my time? I'd say, I'm going to get off it in the next 15 minutes. And that would be it. It'd be the whole time gone. Got to a point when I was here that I was still, you know, because I was like at university and I was like, oh, you're meeting people and so-and-so who I met in the bridge and a different college. I'll send a message. <laughs> you know, after a while, I was like, this is, this is good and everything, but this, this, this takes too much of my time and I can't justify it. So I never got Twitter. This was like before Twitter happened, or at least I didn't hear about it because maybe I wasn't very hip. But, um, so I didn't get Twitter, I didn't get Instagram. Um, and you deleted your Facebook. And I, no, I, actually my Facebook exists. I probably shouldn't say that in any, <laughs> in any kind of facet. That, but to all the people, anyone who's ever sent me a Facebook message, I just haven't checked it for about 10 years. Um, so it's very theoretical. Um, but I mean, I'm just, I, I guess in some ways a private, person. Um, that seems paradoxical as an actor who's on a stage talking about himself. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not very technological either. So I'm quite happy to float around and not know what's going on with, you know, someone's dinner, which looked really pretty or whatever. I mean, I think social media has a fantastic role to play in modern society and it's a wonderful piece of technology and it's a wonderful forum. It can be at its best. It's just not for me. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you were, you're a very private person. Following on from that, how have you sort of personally dealt with the fame that you got from being such a, an important role in the Harry Potter series from a young age? Yes. <laughs> um, it's not often I hear Dean Thomas referred to as an I important role important. in the Harry Potter, <laughs> but I will savour it. You know, you've got to, take the, you've got to take the good bits when they come, right? I was a fan. Um, oh, well, that's very nice to hear. Um, yeah, I think there was a really strange thing that happened. I was 11 years old. I got out of a car in Leicester Square and people literally shouted my name. I still to this day don't know if I imagined that or if that actually happened because this was the first Harry Potter film premiere and I, I, I don't know, maybe it was on IMDb. Where were the cast lists? Did people know this information? Um, I still think it's possible I could have just imagined it. but. Um, it is a very weird thing when people know you and you don't know them. It's such a banal point, but it is that there's something very odd in that. And I'm quite, um, um, I said I was private and there's truth in that, but also I'm going to say I'm, I'm sort of outgoing, I guess, right? And I like talking to people and I'm curious. And so, so 
I sit on the tube and I'm being snoopy and I'm like looking at the other people on the tube. Kind of the problem with that is then someone might look at me and be like, ah, oh, and I'll be like, okay, I think, oh, it's someone I know, I've forgotten. And I've, I get into this situation probably at least every month, probably every couple of weeks, um, that I think someone is someone I know and then it's not, they know me and I, and I just hedge my bets. Do you know what I mean? It's awful, my memory's bad, so I'm like, oh yeah, how are you doing? They're like, good, I love that show. I was like, yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing and that is good, I'll put that hat on. Um, it's weird, man, but I'm, I'm more and more these days, I'm very, I'm grateful for it. I always have been, do you know what I mean? It has, the fact that I've done thing that people, things that people have seen, um, is in itself a privilege, right? I'm an actor, it's storytelling. It doesn't exist if no one watches it. Do you know what I mean? I can't do Hamlet in my room on my own, it's not a thing. Um, so if I've done something, whatever it is, even if it's like, say, one line in a Harry Potter movie and someone's seen that, that is, for someone to come up to me and say they cared about it or remembered it in any way, it makes me feel incredibly grateful, do you know, to have had the privilege to be part of that thing, something which affected people, something, to be honest, with Harry Potter fans, I'm like, you must love that. I think you must really love that to know who I am. Do you know what I mean? I, um, I watched The Godfather recently again for the like, umpteenth time and realised I can pretty much quote along to the whole movie. Um, and this is the thing I always think. I think if I saw, if anyone knows this movie, poorly, from like the first Godfather walk down the street, I would not looking exactly as he did in 1972 or whenever it was that it was shot. I would never recognize him. You know, I think it's such a hype for people to recognize me as Dean Thomas from Harry Potter. I'm like, that you must have watched those movies. <laughs> um, and that makes me feel, you know, grateful to have been part of something that touched people in that way. Um, you know, I've done things that, I did a play in a pub theatre in Islington where like, we had three people in the audience and we had three people in the cast and one stage manager, so we outnumbered that. I mean, it's, you know, so you just, it, it, I'm glad to have it, but it comes with strange little, little things and little dissonances, which I think I ride out the better for being, I think, relatively open as a person. I have friends who are very private, um, much more private than me and not gregarious, not out, sort of outgoing. And it, it, it's a real challenge for them. And there is some kind of an expectation, I think, on them that they are available. People say, well, you know, you're an actor. I said, well, being an actor means you like acting. It doesn't mean you like talking to strangers in the street. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I don't think it's the same thing. As it happens, I like talking to strangers in the street. So, you know, I'm okay with it. And moving to the rest of your career, could mm. you tell us a bit about the scope of your work outside of the Harry Potter and how to get away with murder franchises, what you've enjoyed, what you haven't? Mm. Boy, that's a big question. Um, yeah, um, I've taken something from everything. I've enjoyed every job. You know, I've, I've, I have a career which is my hobby, which is my passion. Um, I remind myself as frequently as I can, and often it comes very easily to me, that I'm incredibly fortunate to get to do what I love for a living. Um, and not just that, it comes with a stupid amount of perks, in my case, because I've been fortunate. So, you know, last year I made a movie in Brazil. I'm half Brazilian. Um, you know, my family's in Rio. I got to be in Rio making a movie in Portuguese. Do you know what I mean? That, I mean, it was, an, it was, that was a real incredible, kind of experience and a real gift. Um, I get to travel with my work. I get to meet different people. I need to get to tell stories. I get to, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of the, the, the blessings, the, the bounty of it is kind of endless. Um, so it's something I'm, I'm, I'm sort of massively fond of everything. A few things that kind of stand out, I guess I did probably one of my, um, it was my third job, maybe, after I left here. Um, I did a play at the National Theatre. I did two plays at the National Theatre. Um, and I remember the day I heard that I got the job, and I was just walking down the South Bank with my then girlfriend, and we were just, I was, the sun was shining. I was like, this is literally all is right in the world. Like, I'm gonna get to work in that theatre. Like, for me, that was so exciting. Um, and there was, in the second of the plays I did, there was a sort of obscure Shakespeare play called Time and of Athens. Um, there was this scene where my character, who's a servant of Timon of Athens, who goes bankrupt and then sends his 
servant out to his friends to say, you know, I've thrown lots of parties and given you lots of money in the past. Can you just bail me out a little? And they all go, mm, sorry. Um, and so I had this scene where I'd ask someone for money on his behalf. And she says no, walks off. And, you know, like, the speech is a bit of a, like, people are unbelievable, literally unbelievable behavior. Um, but it's a soliloquy. There's a character that in the folio is called literally just servant. And he has a soliloquy, you know, he's given the room to speak. It's one of the things I find so beautiful about Shakespeare. Um, and uh, yeah, I turned out in the Olivier Theatre, if anyone knows it, which is this massive, the main, main, whatever that means, the biggest space in the National, um, and was confronted with the sea of people. Um, and I've probably never been so thrilled in my life. Like it's, uh, you know, I just came off stage and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Felt like I'd done a bungee jump or something and I went to some of the like old hands who'd like worked at the National quite a lot. I was like, <laughs> they were like, yeah, you'll, it'll get old. And it was funny, I was like, it's never going to get old, that's ridiculous. By the next night I came off and I was like, oh, okay. It's still thrilling, it's still exciting, but there was something about that first time which was so like, that's a very special place and space as well because it's, it's built, it's modelled on Epidavros and, and, and it, the, the kind of centre spot, the sweet spot in the middle of the stage apparently was designed in such a way that the audience come round to your periphery. So you can't see, so if you stand in the right spot, you see them all around you. And that's everything that you see. Uh, but yeah, you can see them all and they can all see you. And it focuses that energy in such a kind of empowering way or at least it was for me. So that was really lovely. I mean, I could go on and on, but I'll let you ask more questions, probably more interesting. Such a large part of your work has been done in the theatre. Mm. What was your introduction to the theatre and has your journey since mm. then developed? Ah, yes, this is something I probably should go back to then. I was talking about how quite specifically my privilege has affected my career and has basically <laughs> created it um, in a very tangible way. Um, the first thing I ever did was a play with the National Youth Music Theatre at Shakespeare's Globe, um, which was a play about child actors in Shakespeare's time. Um, and they came to my school. I went to a fancy prep school, Westminster Under School. Um, and I'm sure the National Youth Music Theatre didn't just turn up at every school around the country to audition all the kids. Um, but they came to mine. Um, and I didn't audition because I thought, Pretty much, a lot of my friends, most of them auditioned. And I remember thinking, fools, they're not gonna get the part. That's, they don't know, this is at the Globe. The reason I had that kind of relationship with the Globe is because my dad's an actor and he was in the opening season there. So the first play I ever remember seeing was Mark Rylance playing Henry V in the Globe in the opening season. My dad was the King of France and that, anyone who's ever been in that space, I mean, it, it has something very, magical, you know, to me is also as a kid, when I went to see that, I was like seven or something. I loved history. I was like, <gasps> it's like going back in time. And I mean, my dad's the King of France. And I'm like, this is brilliant. Um, so I had a really kind of fixed idea of how wonderful that place was and how elevated it was. And basically I was looking askance at everyone else being like, they're not going to put you on that stage, uh, nor me. So I did an audition. Obviously what also I was doing was protecting myself because I knew even then I wanted to be an actor, you know, from probably even before I ever saw a play because my dad's an actor and I used to grow up watching films he'd been in and, and I thought that sounds, that sounds good and then I picked up on the fact that he mostly was at home reading his books and having afternoon naps and I thought that's a job I could do. <laughs> um, so I knew I wanted to do it and I didn't want to try and fail. I didn't want to expose myself. So between those reasons I didn't audition and then uh, I told my dad about it and he said, but isn't that something you'd want to do? I said, yes, but, and he kind of realized that obviously I'd sort of held myself back um, and managed to get in touch with them or got my, asked my English teacher too and said, look, we have a child who didn't audition, but he'd love to come. Are there any more first round auditions? His parents will take him there. They said, we're only on the second round. Uh, we're already on the second round and only one kid from my school had got through. And they said, it's the recall stage, but we'll make an exception, he can come, um, which they had no need to do. And, um, I went and I got the, I got the part, it's the National Youth Music Theatre, I got the part with the most acting and the least singing. Um, sort of proportionally, which probably was about right, good casting. Um, and you know, there I was on the Globe stage and I closed the play with an epilogue and I had a long monologue and it was, it was and randomly, Eddie Redmayne was in that play. 
Um, I found that when I found the program again recently, Edward Redmayne 17. And I met him because I played a part that he had earlier played. And, and I said that to him. And he was like, yes, I remember that now. So it was weird. Um, but, um, but, you know, it was because I did that play that I ended up doing Harry Potter. Sorry, my circuitous route back to the story. Um, so how did you, sorry, just to jump saw. in, how did you get cast as... As it, Thompson. Yeah. So, I, again, they came to my school, they auditioned everyone, I did an audition, I was like, it's a movie, <laughs> you're all fools, I'm the person who got the play, not any of you, and I'm not going to get this, you're not going to get, you know, again, really, what it actually was, I was just hiding behind my fear. Um, and I did an audition, and someone from the casting team on Potter saw me in the play. And they called, got in touch and said, would you like to audition? And I said, well, you know, as, as you've asked, I can, I'll check my schedule, you know, fix the time. And yeah, and I got the part. So, you know, it, it all came from there. I cannot imagine what the original question was at this stage. I've talked so circuitously, I apologize. <laughs> I ramble in this way. Um, um, can you tell us also a bit about the transition from your work on screen to on stage? Yes. And if there are any challenges to this, whether you enjoyed it? Um, it's funny. I think, I think because of kind of the things I've talked about and my relationship with it um, and what I grew up seeing and what I like going to, um, I've always thought of myself as more kind of from theatre than from screen. Uh, and more comfortable in that world, and more comfortable in a rehearsal room. Um, I realised my career probably looks like the opposite, like I probably went the other way. I did Harry Potter and I did this and all, I did, did, did a little play here and there. Um, but I guess the thing is with Harry Potter, I had very little to do, and, but I was doing school plays or I was doing plays at Oxford. You know, that's where I was kind of more exercising my muscles. It's kind of the, the, the place I feel more comfortable. Um, I worked with an amazing Spanish actor on my year abroad who basically kind of just took me in and he said something quite radical. He said, um, a set isn't a place for actors. He says it's for the lighting technique, it's for the gaffer and it's for the DP and it's for the director, and it, it's for everyone. The stage is a place for actors. You're the people who go on the stage, and that is that. Um, it's a radical point, um, but there is a challenge in working in an environment where everything happens at the same time, or so much is happening at the same time. Um, you don't have the luxury of rehearsals. Um, you don't have the space to try, fail, make bad decisions, and find there's something good in that. Um, make good decisions, feel, oh, that doesn't stand the course, and then pare down into what it actually is that will stand up bef before an audience and where the wiggle room is for you to play. You, by the time you put a play on, you have a quite a full-on knowledge and intimate working of what it is. If you're working on screen, you are more often than not kind of busking it. Um, which was really difficult for me um, to kind of get used to. And I reflected on this a lot recently, and I think one of, one of kind of the biggest things for me was when you're on stage as an actor, you have editorial control. If I take a long pause, that's how it is tonight, even if the director told me not to do it. If I zip through it, that's how it is, you know? Um, and also, the things you play are informing the story. In the sense that if everyone here is now looking at me, they still sense you. If everyone, when you're asking a question, is looking at you, they still sense me. I'm contributing to what the space is and how it functions. Um, in a film, when the camera's on you, I don't exist. I'm not there. So if I play the scene through and I do something that, isn't, that doesn't make the final cut, it, it never existed. Um, there's a big challenge in that, adjusting to that lack of control um, and actually embracing it, if you can. Um, I made a film towards the end of last year, which was, sounds mad um, and is mad, but hopefully will be very good. Um, a brilliant script. Uh, a Swedish film in Swedish, Italian and English set in Italy. Um, and the director had been a novelist and he's now a screenwriter and a director and he wrote it and blah, 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 blah. He worked in a very unusual way. He worked with somebody he called, he said, I like to work with opposites. 
So we'll play the scene, but I'll give you a, a, a kind of marquee note that might have nothing to do with the scene. Play it, and we'll see what happens. So there was um, the kind of easiest example. There was one scene where my character, um, who's a footballer, um, is talking to another, the other character who's a footballer, and I tell him, I've been sold. <clears throat> and he looked at me and he went, one of the pieces directly he did on one take, he said, play it like he's been sold. And I start, and there was a time in my career where I would have gone, that's obviously mental, that's not what the scene's doing. I'll try and understand what he means by that, I guess, and I'll try and, I'll try and use that and, and get that into the way I, I feel the scene should be. Again, that was about control. Because in a way, you have that responsibility on stage, right? You have to, you have to understand what works, what doesn't. You have to do it. You can't just, you know, there's some things you do in the first week of rehearsal, you go, cool, we don't need to inflict that on an audience. Um, it's different on screen because actually what, what I realize, at least the way I look at it now, is that what you're doing is you're giving raw material for the editor. So you're not, you're, it's not your responsibility to look after the end product in that way in terms of pacing, in terms of, obviously, it helps the energy of the scene and the, the most common note you ever get <laughs> in a set or in a rehearsal room is, just do a bit quicker. <laughs> it's really great, that thing you're doing. Stop enjoying it so much and keep playing the scene, um, which is, for the most part, is, a, is, is almost always a good note. But there are responsibilities that you don't have, which I realized by working in that way and by stopping, uh, by not cleaving to the end product, I was freer and I was more playful. Um, and it gives you back some of that, it gave me back some of that freedom that I feel like you can have in rehearsal room that I'd never really felt you can have on a set. That, that, that's sort of some thoughts about the challenges and the differences of those things, but that's something that's quite fresh for me. Just following on from that, with so many huge movies being made every year, in comparison to that, what challenges do you think theatre faces as an art form in <sighs> the modern world? Huge challenges. <laughs> massive, massive existential challenges. I mean, I think, it is the journey of probably all popular art, is that something else comes along and then it stops being so popular and then it becomes a bit more rarefied and then it really has to ask the question, what are we doing, why are we doing it, is it important, how do we, how do we keep this flame alive? Um, for me, theatre has to be something that is for everyone. It has to be a space that is for everyone. It has to tell different kind of stories. If you end up with a, a kind of theater world or a theater community that is telling the same stories for the same people, it's dying. It's not gonna go anywhere. Then, but then, it, then it becomes, you know, oh, I went to the theater to see so-and-so. He's very good, we know he's very good. Was he good? Yeah, he was very good. You know, and it's just about saying, I went to see X, who is brilliant, and you didn't go, but I got the tickets. Do you know what I mean? It's a, and look, that's always existed, right? I mean, you had those seats at the Globe where people sat at the side because they wanted to be seen, not to see. Well, that's the other side is they're trying to... The people went to hear a play, not to see it. But, I mean, it, it, it's a real... It's something that has to be fought against. And I did a play this summer, which I'm massively proud to have done because I think this play, in a way, identified, that's the problem, <laughs> and let's take it on. I think a lot of theatres um, do a lot of really good work, community outreach work, and try and engage the local community and try and tell stories that are more relevant. Some theatres do it more successfully than others. Um, but I think sometimes you need to recognise that the answers need to be quite radical. Do you know what I mean? You can't just put on the same plays you always put. Look, I love Chekhov. I think he's great. I love his plays. I'll always go and see them. But, you know, maybe just putting on some Chekhov plays and, like, branding it in such a way or, like, targeting at a young audience is... is, is that, that's not enough. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying there shouldn't be a place for that because I say, I personally love it and I would miss it. Um, but, um, but you need to tell as I was mentioning before when we were talking about diversity, different kinds of stories from different perspectives in different ways. Uh, and this play I did was a, was a play at the Young Vic called Tree, um, which started f uh, with a rave. It started with a rave. The audience came in, down some stairs, 
there's a DJ, the cast are dancing around, and the first thing we would do is run up to the first people who come up and be like, welcome, welcome, thank you for joining us, welcome, welcome, come, come and shake a leg with us, come and dance, come and dance, come and be with us. People are like, well, on the stage, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine, don't be afraid. And you realize that's such a barrier. People think, I sit here, you do your thing there, and I, oh, oh, yeah, very nice, listen to some Shakespeare, look like you're paying attention, wake up, you know. <laughs> no, do you know what I mean? Like, passionately, passionately from the bottom of my heart, no. I always used to love when a school group came in and I was doing like a Shakespeare play, I was like, great, hopefully they'll heckle. Let's engage them. Let's tell the story to people who have never heard it before. Not the people who go, well, it was good, but when I saw uh, Ian McKellen do it, of course, it was much better. You know, I, 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 Ian McKellen's great. I'm not trying to slag him off. The point is, you have to tell it afresh. You have to tell it fresh or it doesn't work. And, and this play was brilliant in that way because it said, the space is yours. The stage is yours. Come and dance with us. Something really weird happening, happened during the, during the run of that play. It was a, kind of, a couple of previews in, and I was sort of knelt around the outside of the stage. It had quite a heavy story. I was witnessing the execution and literally the stringing up of my father. Um, yeah, in sort of apartheid South Africa. I mean, it was heavy. Uh, and I'm there kneeling around the outside, like streaming with tears, doing my acting, looking at it. And I just realized someone's next to me with a phone just filming me about as far away as you are here. So I'm here like, Bleh. and then I'm just like, is that? Is that? And I'm like, stay in the scene, stay in the scene. And I'm like, he's bloody filming me. I got upstage, I was like, something weird happened. Someone filmed, someone was like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're letting audiences use their phones. I was like, obviously I was just like snoozing at that point in like rehearsals where that was, do you know what I mean? I was just like having a little nap. I was like, I think I've got five minutes and I just missed the memo, my fault. But, um, but that was a very radical thing. People were told you can come into this space, you can tweet, you can take pictures. You don't have to, be it's not about behaving. It's not about eat your greens culture. Come in, dance. This is your space, enjoy yourself, tweet. I don't know, Periscope, I don't know anything about social media, so I'm exposing myself here. But do all those things that you would do. This is more like a gig, it's free, it's more, and we got the audience on stage at the end, we took a curtain call, and then we danced for another half hour. Sometimes the DJ puts on candy and you've got people doing an electric slide all over the place, I mean, it was great. Do you know what I mean? Because it's a completely, and I've never played to such young, diverse audiences in my life, or seen such young and diverse audiences. Um, so that was a real, gift to be part of. So I think that's very much part of what theatre needs to do to fight for its place and make its case to be relevant. Otherwise, it dies. My final question before moving on to the audience mm. is quite broad. It's what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced in your career and have you overcome them? <laughs> There was a question someone asked me, uh, oh, maybe I should leave it for the Q&A. No, um, what are the biggest challenges I've overcome in my career? God. For me, doing something that I love doing uh, and that is so important to me, kind of the stakes are high. Do you know what I mean? So anything that goes wrong, I'm like, it's a disaster. So I'm not working. I'm like, no, no one likes my work. I'll never work again. You know, I, things are very extreme. So, so things I've sort of many times in my career, as a kind of matter of course, have just lost perspective on things in that way, things which really are more minor. I'm trying to think of sort of very big challenges. In a way, everything, over, everything represents a challenge, right? Every job, every... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to something which I don't know if it's the biggest, but it was a big challenge for me, which uh, goes to a question that was asked earlier. Um, so I went to America to do this television show called How to Get Away with Murder. I'd never done network television before in my life. Um, and I'd never really watched network television. I think like ER reruns or something, but like basically I didn't know the beast and I didn't really understand how it worked and how it was made. Um, so on, Oh gosh, is it really bad to talk about this because it might be a spoiler. Um, For How to Get Away with Murder. Yeah, but I feel like that <laughs> thing was aired a long time ago. Yeah, it's, it's on Netflix, I guess. <laughs> their it? fault if they Okay, this is probably if I just say spoiler warrant, it's a spoiler. Is anyone in here so, like, desperate not to hear it? I don't know. I'm like, I feel like for the people at home, if anyone watches this on YouTube or anything, anyone's got like a spare hour in their day and wants to listen to me. Um, all right, I'll just tell the story. I've said it's a spoiler, apologies. <laughs> Cover your ears if you don't want to hear it. So, How to Get Away with Murder is a television show with a very kind of clever central premise, 
which is you see these law students arriving at university, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and they've got all this opportunity and everything's going to be great for them and good for them, and then you flash forward, or maybe you start with it, I can't remember what the order was, to them disposing of a body. And the question, four months later, so the question is, how do these people get to here? Um, <laughs> one of the challenges for me was, how do I get to there? Because ep the network television is written episode to episode. So one of the ch massive challenges was you would sometimes get scripts very late, um, sometimes two days ahead. Um, you're, shoot, you're in, you know, I don't know how long is an episode, 60 pages or however long, you know, maybe it might be 70 scenes or whatever. I might be in, uh, in that first episode, I had a heavy workload, so I might be in 40 of those scenes. Um, it lands two days before, I'm working all of those days in between. I'm like, when do I do this? And also at that, in my, the first season, I was coming from it from a very theater perspective. So I was like, I'm gonna do all the work I would do in the run up to rehearsal, during rehearsal. And I, you just can't do that with two days out. Um, so that was a massive challenge, adjusting to working in that kind of way with that kind of rapidity, making quick choices, trusting them. Uh, and it was a complete education in every way. And there, there was a lot that I gained from it that was fantastically useful, especially for the way I approach my work before and has informed the way I go and work in theatre or do other things. That's one of the, kind of the beautiful things about working in different media. You learn things, you take them, and you go, that's interesting, there's something in that. Even if you might do that differently somewhere else, there's really something in that to be held on to. Um, but more specifically, the question was, how do these students get there? The reason, the fact that it's written episode to episode meant that we didn't know who committed the murder. And so I, we were there, and every episode, we'd have this conversation with one of the writers, which we'd be like, can you tell? They were like, we don't know, we haven't decided yet. I was like, cool. Well, that is quite problematic for us. And they're like, no. I remember the writers, and, and bless them, they were always trying to talk us down from the ledge, because we were like pulling our hair and be like, what are we playing? I literally might have killed someone I don't even know. Um, <laughs> And, the, and they, so they were always just trying to calm us down. One of them said, well, you know, in life you don't know what's going to happen. I was like, well, yeah, sorry. I was like, two, two points to that. In life you don't. In plays, in films, in scripts, you do. And it's useful because you can decide I'm going to build towards that or I'm going to not build to what you make choices accordingly. Right? You want to know where the arc of the character is going so you can construct it and literally work out how you get there. So that especially when you're shooting out sequences, you always do on screen, pretty much. So that was my first point to that as I was like foaming at the mouth, being like, please just tell me what I'm doing. Um, and the other thing, which I think is the more salient point, is like, but always in life, you well, not always, but you tend to know what you've just done, especially if it's the one thing which is going to change your life for forever. So please don't tell me, oh, you just don't know, it's real. I was like, not real, it's madness. So we were kind of playing these scenes, and we didn't know who killed the person. I mean, imagine, you're like, the, 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 what, how does that, if, you know, we kill someone now, if you kill someone now and wrote me in, I'm pissed off with you. <laughs> That changes the dynamic. If I do it, I rope you in. If we do it together, it, I mean, it, 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 it's information that is so vital for the playing of a scene. You know? These are like the basic things you need to have straight. And we didn't have that information. So, um, you know, I, I, I had, to, you had to make a choice. What I realized was like, you can't play nothing. I can't play maybe. So I was just, as I got to a point, I was like, Again, I don't have to look, I guess in a way, the lesson which I would learn much later is you don't have to look after the final yeah. outcome. And so what I did in that context, I think was useful. I was like, well, make a choice. And I made a choice and I played it. And that was that. <laughs> At least I wasn't just floating around hedging my bets. Looking back on it, do you feel like you would have played it differently knowing how the series ended? Yeah, I mean, every, generally all of us were like, well, if we had known it was like that, um, but, um, but actually, I came off, well, because I guessed right. And I played a couple, but, you know, I guessed right. I spent like four, ep five, six episodes just like completely praying it out. <laughs> By the time I was like, I just have to make a choice because they don't know and, and I can't play nothing. Um, I happened to make the right choice. But, um, but the answer still stands. Yes, I would still do it differently. <laughs> Every time I watch anything I've done, I'm like, oh, just one more chance, please. I can do it better. I can do it better. Um, so I think I always have that kind of regret when, I, when I'm confronted with my own work. Yeah.
On that note, we'll move to audience questions. Mm. So if you have a question, please raise your hand in the air, wait for the microphone to come to you, and please stand up when you ask your question. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Could we go to the hand in the back row over there? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, so now that you're so known for playing um, an American character in an American TV show, do you ever get confused for being American on the street? And if so, how do you um, deal with that? Um, so today, this morning, um, I met a guy on the train platform. I came here from Bury St. Edmunds quite randomly. Um, and I got chatting to this guy on the train, which was like from Ips to Ipswich from Bury St. Anyway, extraneous detail. Um, who said to, who said to me, oh, you look like that guy. Oh, and so we got talking. I was like, yes, it's me. He was like, oh, oh wow, weird. What are you doing here? I was like, yeah, well, you know, I'd travel, I guess, uh, to, you know, smaller market towns. Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. So we got chatting. And then he said, where are you headed to then? And I was like, well, you know, I have to change at London, but I have to get to Oxford, so I have to get round on the tube. And he goes, are you going to be all right doing that? <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry? He was like, are you, are you going to be all right on the tube? Do you know how the tube, what, can I help you with that? I was like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, you know, I was, grew up in zone two. I've lived in London all my life. He was like, okay. Okay, sort of didn't trust me. And I'm thinking, I'm like, do you, can you not hear that I'm not American? This is kind of always the question I have. I'm like, can you not hear it? The amount of people who are like, so what are you doing in London? I was like, just literally living. Just as always the same. I've always lived here. People are, are friends of mine are like, oh, you're back, you're back in London. I was like, I've always been, I went to America to shoot. It finished, I came back. Um, um, are you based in London now? I was like, it's, I'm not American. I've never lived in America. Um, yeah, it happens kind of extraordinarily frequently. To me, I mean, I, I get it. No one has any reason to know anything about me, right? So you see in a show, you think, well, he's American. That's, I feel grateful that anyone bought it at all because I'd never done the accent before and I pranged out about it and did a lot of work on it. So I'm grateful for that in that respect. But um, it is always strange when you're having a conversation with someone and I'm like, I'm talking like this and you think I'm American still. I'm like, it's so odd. But um, I guess there's a lesson in that. You know, we often, we hear what we expect to hear. We see what we expect to see. And I, I, I see that a lot. And I would have that even in America sometimes. I would do the accent the whole time and I would talk to people and people would be like, where are you from? And they got to, you know, I wasn't going to lie and be like, Ohio. You know, so I was like, I'm, I'm from London, speaking in an American accent. And some people would be like, cool. And I'd be like, okay, good. Maybe just other people aren't sensitive to accents. Or maybe they're just not as nosy as I am. But yeah, it does happen. Is there another question? Could we go to the hand here? So obviously the role of Romeo at the Globe is quite a big one, but I wondered if there was any genre or particular role that you've always longed to play and what that might be. Like so many. <laughs> um, I, I, the first play I ever remember seeing, as I say, was a, a, probably the first play I ever saw was a Shakespeare play. I love Shakespeare. I get geeky about it. It's what, you know. I was going to say gets me off sounds a bit wrong, but um, <laughs> you know, I really like it. And the times I've got to do Shakespeare plays have been fantastic kind of workouts in some, so many ways. Um, so yes, I'm very grateful to get to go and play that part in that place, which is a theatre that is so important <laughs> to me, as I've sort of said. Um, the first place I ever sort of did anything proper, the first place I ever remember seeing a play, you know, a place, you know, my dad was involved as they were sort of finishing the building, so I sort of knew it, so everything, my anxiety dream is set in the globe. Um, so it is kind of a dream job, if, I guess the question is about dream jobs. And um, so, yeah, I, I love, there's so many Shakespearean parts that I would like to play one day. Um, it's funny, last year, I was sitting there kind of doing this thing that I think probably actors quite frequently do. I don't know. I feel that this is not just me who's weird like this. And I sort of sitting back fantasizing about what ideally all the work in 2020 that <laughs> I would do. I'd be like the dream things. And I'd be like, hmm, I'd like to do a Shakespeare play. And I'm like, oh, what Shakespeare play? Would I? It, you know, this it has no basis in fact. If people aren't putting it on or they might not want to audition you, it's never going to happen. And I'm sitting there thinking, 
Yeah, I would like to do a Shakespeare play. It's been about, it will have been four years since I did another, my last one. What part would I like to play? And I remember thinking, I don't think I want to play Romeo just yet. <laughs> and then it happened, I was like, well, you're never ready. So, <laughs> I mean, hopefully I will be by the time we open. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I'm very sort of grateful that the opportunity has come my way. So I, I guess lots of Shakespeare. But there are other things, you know, I wouldn't want a career doing just one thing for the reasons that I've said. Um, but that's a kind of big part of what I want my career to be. Um, can we just go to the hand right next to you? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know how much stuff in other languages you've done, but you mentioned like Brazilian hmm. and some Italian stuff. I was just wondering, do you think the way you would portray the same scene in English like, would differ than doing it in another language? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes. Translation is creation, right? I mean, it's not the same thing. Um, it can't be. Um, so... Absolutely, inherently, it will be different. Um, different languages have different resonances, have different um, echoes, different connotations go with the word. Sometimes ideas are expressed more succinctly in one thing or another. Often, I, like, I, like I, uh, you know, I said something in Portuguese because that, to me that's the best way of expressing that idea. I still, there is obviously a way to say it in English and, you know, I was brought up here for most of my, you know, I lived in Brazil for a year when I was six, I always go, but, you know, my English is better than my Portuguese, but it's a word that I reach for, that's an idea that I express in Portuguese <coughs> that feels cleaner in Portuguese to me. So, um, yeah, definitely, and I think that's one of the fascinating things um, of having the opportunity to get to work in other languages, which I sort of really did for the first time last year, so as I say, I, I, I mostly spoke English in the English, Italian, Swedish thing, um, but I had a couple of scenes in Italian. I'd never spoken Italian before, but you know, I studied Spanish, Portuguese, and uh, I did A-level French, and I, you know, I was like, this, this might sound silly. Hopefully, it doesn't sound too silly. I was like, I can, I know what it says. Do you know what I mean? I read it. I know, I, I know what it says. I have an idea of how this language works because it is so similar. Um, and so, yeah, playing, playing in another language is, language is, is, is a real gift. And likewise, doing, doing the movie in, uh, in Brazil. The challenge with that was that I was playing someone who had been brought up and lived all their life there. And I have family there. I speak Portuguese with my mum, but it's still different. And my mastery of the language is not comparable to my mastery of English. And so there are things which I had to examine that I said, literally dialect things that I would say... I would say things in one way and that picked that up from a weird, that's another region of Brazil, but the rest of my accent is somewhere else and actually that's something that is, probably is actually mispronounced and I always confuse those sounds, but it's very close. Little things like that you have to be forensic about. It was a huge challenge in that respect, going back to what is literally my mother tongue <laughs> and uh, realizing that uh, kind of speaking a bit funny, basically. Um, but. And, and the other thing is the difficulty of not having all those associations at your fingertips, or at least not to the extent that I do in English. So if someone would say something, I'd be like, I know what that phrasing is. Do you know what I mean? Or that, that, and you need, you, that's a lot of your toolkit as an actor, understanding how ways of expression give us an insight into character, background, whatever, and you can play with those. That doesn't mean you're prescribed by those things, but there are possibilities in them. Um, even intonation, speech patterns, rhythms. Um, so that was a real, real challenge, but, um, but so exciting for that reason, you know, so, and as someone who studied languages, fantastically interesting to kind of get involved with that challenge. We have time for one more question. Um, could we go to the hand on, yeah, right there. Hi, um, this is a bit of a spoiler in case anyone hasn't seen a lot of the episodes. <laughs> Well, I hope not. Because um, you were saying that for the first season, you didn't really know how it was going to go. Um, when your character died... Shock! <laughs> wow! <laughs> Put it all over the video, because it's ruined for the people in here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, how much earlier did you know, or was it something that like, you chose to like, stop working for How to Get With Murder, and so then the death was put in? Or, yeah, I was just curious to know how that process works. So, um, the spoiler's been given, so I will <laughs> lean into it heartily now. Um, yeah, we 
the put the kind of the structure of the show is that there's a mystery every season. There's a we see them in real time, we see them in the future. Something big has happened, and you're in the aftermath of that big thing. Um, so in the first season, it was someone got killed, and these people are getting rid of the body. In the second season, it's someone's got shot. Um, in the third season, it's someone's dead. Um, and uh, the writer decided early on that he thought, you know, the show is about surprising people. Uh, it's about keeping people on the edge of their seat, twists and turns and all the rest of it. Um, so he thought, I think I need to do something big. And he had a meeting at the beginning of the season. So we've got someone and it's someone close that, that the person who it wasn't, unsurprisingly, really, is Viola Davis's character, obviously. Um, but they had it so that she lifts up a sheet, you never see who she is, and she's devastated by it. So it's someone close. And he said, I think it has to be one of you guys. Um, and he said that, and I don't know who it is. Um, and I will like it, like like in the first season, always the same. <laughs> You're dealing with something in it, so it sort of like potentially could have been some weird reality show, which is like, oh, who's losing their job? Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah. He, Pete Nowak, the creator of the show, didn't know, and he knew it was going to be one of us, and he said, I will let you know as soon as it. And as I do, as I made that decision, but you know, the way we make the choices on the show and it will be a while. So it must have been, maybe when we were shooting episode seven, it was revealed in episode nine or maybe episode six. So it was sort of most of the way through the first part of the season. Um, and it was, it was like, we were all talking about it. We were all talking, and I got a call from his assistant that just said, hi, Pete, I'd like to talk to you. Come in. And I was like, cool, then it's me then. Don't worry, everyone. I was like, I've cracked this one. And I remember going in to chat to him, and we always go in and have a sort of, have a sort of nice chat because we don't, you know, he's in the writer's room writing the show and we're on set, and so we see each other, but not all the time. So in the time I would sort of go into his office and sit down and have a little chat first. And so we go in, I'm like, hey, Dan, people, what's going on? Blah, 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 blah. And we start chatting. And as we start chatting, I'm thinking, God, you're making this hard for yourself, Pete. You've just got to come out and say it. I'm all right. Just say it, though, because otherwise we're going to talk for 10 minutes. And that's what we do, chat for like 10 minutes. And I was just sitting there thinking, oh, I feel bad for you, Pete. <laughs> this is, I wouldn't like to have to tell me this. Um, yeah, but um, no, it wasn't. It was, I'm told. <laughs> no, and I have every reason to believe it was a creative decision. It was like, and I think it was completely right, right? The character that I played took up a lot of space on the show. Um, and there were a lot of storylines that were like about him and blah, blah, blah. And you do that and it changes the dynamic in a very significant way, affects the lead character in probably the most significant way. There, were, there was a lot of dramatic mileage that was got out of it. Um, and like frees up space for the other characters. We had three seasons where basically like there's a mystery. <laughs> My friend on the show <laughs> who plays a character called Connor, his name's Jack Fallahy, was like, obviously not a surprise. First season, who killed the guy? West did. Who shot Annalise? Spoiler again, sorry. This is full of spoilers. <laughs> West did. Who's dead? Wes. Always the same. Always you. <laughs> Maybe now next season, one of us will get to do something. Um, I mean, I'm joking. I'm sort of paraphrasing him, but, um, but, um, he, he, but he was right, you know, there was an observation there that like, my character had taken up a lot of space and I was cognizant of that. And I was like, I think that's completely right. That makes sense to me. And, 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 you know, it was an amazing job and I'm so grateful for it. It completely transformed my career. I'm under no illusions that <laughs> if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be playing Romeo at the Globe, you know, um, as important as Dean Thomas was. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was also nice for me to get to go and do something else. Like I didn't, as I said, I didn't get into acting to have a steady job. So um, I was grateful for the experience and things ended their due time and it did. And that's cool. That's all good. On that note, that's unfortunately all we have time <laughs> for today. Very fitting. So thank you so much for joining us today. Please join me thanking us.